you found that dream piece of land and now you want to go get your building permit, we're going to talk about 25 essential tips that I've learned over 20 years of doing land development projects that's going to save you massive amounts of time, headache, and money. This is our ultimate guide on how to do this. All right, Anton Stentner podcast, obtaining your building permit for your dream home. So this is part two in what we've already started. And we're going to go through this like essential tips, tricks, things that we've learned over 20 years on how to go get that building permit, whether you're the first time home buyer or you're going to go build your luxury dream home. This really applies to everyone. We got 25 we're going to go through. And, but first, we have to make some assumptions to set the ground rule. One, we assume like you have the land under contract. You're actively hunting for the land like you're in the process right now. And that two, you have a phenomenal, amazing real estate agent who specializes in land that's helping with that journey. Three, we're talking about this from the perspective of permitting in Western Washington. And please understand here in the Seattle Metro, if you can get a permit basically in Seattle, most of California and Oregon, this is applies everywhere because everywhere else is easier than here. So there may be things that we're going to cover that won't directly apply. So this might be overkill for some people, but for, I would say, half the country, this will be the exact list that you're going to need to go through. Is this also specific to rural land for the most part? And this is specific to rural land, so not in-city. In-city would tweak this, but the the outline is similar if you're going to do it in-city, so it's still going to work, but instead of a septic, you're going to go for a sewer. Mm -hmm. You know, Instead of well, you're going to go for public water. It's just minor tweaks, same ideas. Perfect. And then know that... To go obtain these permits, you have to have some tenacity, you have to have some emotional endurance, and you've got to be willing to burn a little cash because getting land and doing a land development project, obtaining your building permit is expensive and it's slow and time consuming. And what we're going to do is we're like laying the foundation to save you a bunch of time, money, and headache over what we've learned over the last 20 years. Yeah, getting permits is about persistence and being the squeaky wheel, as I would say, (laughs) because uh, the county or city that you're in may not work at your pace. And would you say that's almost always the case all over the country? It's almost always, except for in really, really rural areas where you walk in, you talk to Bob behind the counter, and Bob's the permit tech, the head of planning. I mean, he's the department. Most of these, when you walk into a big city... There's 50 people that work there. And your folder could end up somewhere in the corner, (laughs) and then you have to go and find it yourself and then give it to the person making the decision. Section number one, initial preparation. Number one, understand zoning laws. Okay, so we've made the offer. We're getting it under contract. And now we have to really start digging into it. We need to research the local zoning to make sure that the land that we're purchasing will work for residential use and also for our intended use. You need to go find the zoning map. You need to look at what's called a use table. You need to then go check on the allowed and permitted uses. Never trust a website. Never trust an agent. Never trust any third party. And even when you get it from the city or the county verbally, try to always get it in writing. You need some documentation of this process because they're humans and they make mistakes too. And I've been told the wrong things in cities and counties many times by the people on the other side of the counter. Do you have an example of something like that and why this would be important? We went in and we were looking at, now this was a multifamily project, but specifically we were trying to build townhomes and the individual on the other side of the counter basically confirmed it was a medium density versus high density. So all of a sudden the project literally almost doubled in size of units because they gave us the wrong information. Also what happens is we've had clients that walk in and they'll say, hey, is this one in a floodplain? And then they don't confirm it and go look at the map and get a copy of the map. That one has hurt us too when things are near rivers or creeks. Because Uh, the insurance is higher? Insurance are higher, but 
it also may not be buildable, or the base flood elevation may be so tall that it's not worth doing it there. Another example is people will look at a challenging property because of the cost, right? On you know the MLS, it looks like a good deal. So they're like, oh, this is a good deal. And then they walk in and they immediately walk out, you know, holding their hat, discouraged, looking at their shoes, because the person behind the counter told them all the problems and no way to solve it. So we're trying to give you a roadmap on how to solve all these problems. All right, number two, check building codes. So you wanna check the building codes too to understand what level of construction you're gonna to have to go to to be able to build in that area. What is the electrical code? What is the plumbing code? What is the structural code? What is the level of code for, for energy? When I say that, what I'm talking about is Insulation, exterior insulation, interior insulation, soundproofing, insulation below the slab, insulation in the attic, insulation on the roof. See, Washington just passed some really crazy stuff. So all of our energy credits and the level of energy efficiency a house needs, we're at like the top, top, top of the heap right now. So when you see like, you know, you're walking through the appliance store, it says, Energy Star, realize like most of our homes uh, that we're going to be building in Washington over the next five years will all hit high energy efficiencies. Number three, consult with local authorities. So this is what we were talking about. The local authority is going to be the local city or the local county that's in charge of it. I want you to walk in. I want you to go in with a map of the property, the tax ID number, and then an address if it has one and the owner name. You're going to walk up to the counter and ask to speak to someone about the property. Ask them anything they have. Do you have a file on this property? Do you have previously submitted applications? Has there been any permits approved or denied? You want to get what else anyone else has done because that could save you tens of thousands of dollars. It would also tell you the pitfalls. You may look through it and realize it's not buildable. We were looking at one, and I'm not kidding. I mean, it was really on a slope. We're like, man, this is going to turn into a good deal. No, it was a landslide. It was, it was in what's called a geological hazard area. In other words, it was such a landslide hazard area that in order to build there, we were going to have to drill down and drive these gigantic pilings 26 feet into the earth. So you're talking a $150,000, $200,000 foundation. Forget it. Walk away. You want to then tell them about your plan. Hey, my plan is to build a house here. Here's what my house is going to look like. You want to ask them, like, what are the pitfalls? What do people usually run into that prevents this from happening? Do you have a checklist? Do you have an application? Can you walk me through that application and that checklist? And then once again, with the checklist right in front of you, write your notes on it and go, and what do people usually mess up? Oh, how do they do that? Cool. And then how do they solve that problem? You're trying to figure out the quirks of the local area and how to just vibe with what they're going and just go with the flow. Yeah, don't leave it to email. You gotta learn how to talk to people. This is a face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, belly-button-to-belly-button business. If you're gonna build your own home or you wanna get into land development, you gotta get into the people business. Did you say belly-button to belly-button-to-belly-button? Belly like we're touching. That's awkward. <laughs> Okay, number four, find your consultants. So you got to build your land development team. You're going to need a phenomenal real estate agent who understands this. You need a title person, an escrow person. You need an inspector. You may even need someone to do a um, the due diligence package for you. So one thing we do for other land developers and other builders is we do due diligence packages. People can call us and pay us to do them or People even pay us to get their permits or do their projects. Also, you're going to then need your civil engineer, and you're going to need your surveyor, your geotech. The geotech figures out the soils. You need to figure out the wetland biologist, who that's going to be, because there's always environmental impacts. Who's going to be your contractor? Who's going to be your architect? Who's going to be the drain field designer? The drain field designer is going to figure out the septic and generally the well site. Um... Who's going to be your architect or your plans guy, depending on the level we're getting to? Interior designer, landscaper, etc. This is the start of the list. Sometimes this list needs to go even further. 
Number five, hire a land surveyor. You know, once again, we've got the property under contract. The land surveyor, they need to come by. They need to figure out exactly what we got. Because when you look at a legal description, you know, it's just a meet and bounds description. They're hard to read. And when you look at, you know, the MLS or off market or tax records, it may not be the property you're actually thinking. So what you want to do is you want to get a boundary line survey where they put in stakes on the corners. They're looking for encroachments, which is usually fence lines or sheds. And you want to get the topography also shot of the property because then that's going to help you to start doing your layout and then identify the location of easements and any existing utilities or where the utilities are going to come from. Number six, meet drain field designer on site. So you pick up the phone, you call your septic guy, and your septic guy shows up, and this is going to be in our area, anywhere between $500 to $750, sometimes a grand, and they bring a small mini with them. They back the mini off, and you walk out, and you say, I think I'd like the drain field to go here. And then they dig holes to make sure the soil looks like it would perk. And if the soil looks like it would perk, then we start going in for a drain field design. Your drain field designer also needs to start picking out possible well site locations because the septic and the well have a distance they have to be from each other. In our area, in the rural area around uh, Seattle, Snohomish County, King County, you can only be within 100 feet. So the well has to be a minimum of 100 feet away. The problem is, is the neighboring property also has a radius kicking off of their well and their septic. And there's a radius, so you're pinched sometimes on multiple sides. So they got to figure out where that well site's going to go also. Number seven, meet wetland biologist on site. So it just depends on their schedules. In ideal world, you meet the wetland biologist first. And what happens is the wetland biologist says, oh, it looks like it's this type of wetland, aka category, whatever it is. We have this type of vegetation, so we're going to have this type of setback from there. Outside of that setback is the buildable area. So we're not getting a full delineation up front. I'm meeting them on site. I'm paying them for a site inspection, $500 to $750, sometimes a grand, for them to walk around and just give me a layout and a rough sketch. With that rough sketch, I show the drain field designer and I say, stay outside of this area because this is where we're going to be have to fit the drain field and the well. Number eight, meet drain field geotech on site. That was a typo. <laughs> meet the geotech on site. Oh, got it. So the geotech is going to figure out the soils, okay? It's crucial to know and understand the soils because that's going to determine where our foundations are going to go, how deep they have to go, what type of foundation. Also, this soils report may also be kicked over to the drain field designer to give him or her more ammo in the design uh, uh, process. The other part that you're looking for here too is you're trying to figure out how much you're going to have to grade the property in order to put the road in, in order to put the power in too. You're just trying to figure out everything about the land via the geotech. Once again, I'm not paying for the full report. This is simply the site visit. And then if we decide to move forward, then we pay for the full reports from these people. A uh, side question since we're ending this section. How do you find all these people? How often should you shop around for the best value? Um, and also, when should you look at experience? And is this something that you get through your experienced agent? And do you just not question the referral? Or do you still look around? What's your general advice and thoughts on that? If you have a agent who, who specializes in land development or a new construction builder who specializes in building from the ground up, they're going to have their list of amazing people, and especially if they've been doing it for a long time. If they've been doing it for five years or more, most likely they have amazing people. Number two, the biggest mistake you can make right here that will cost you the most amount of money and create the most like emotional freaking heartache is going to your consultants and trying to find the cheapest freaking consultants possible. In this process, your cheapest consultants most of the time are absolute garbage and you get what you pay for. 
And so if you don't know the process, you may need to pay for the Ferrari version because they're going to save you time, money, and heartache. If you know the process and have a basic understanding and have a phenomenal team, I can probably pay for the Toyota Corolla version, okay, where I can get just get the reliable one. We joke around, we have three levels of consultants depending on what our clients want, like, and the level of speed they're looking for. Next item that you do, you go and pull all the permits that happened in the area. Okay, go pull 20 of them. If you want to build in this neighborhood, go find the 20 properties that were permitted around it in the last you know, three to five years, one year hopefully, but let's say five. Look at the civil engineer, look at the drain field designer, look at the geotech. You'll be able to see everything. You'll be able to see the surveyor. The surveyor and the civil engineer may or may not be the same person. If you see the same name pop up over and over again, that person's a gangster. I would trust them. Where are you seeing these names at? From the permit. So I so permits are almost always public record. Wow. So you go to the city, you go to the county, and you say, hey, in this area, what permits have happened in the last five years? And say, I'd like a full copy of the permit. Some of the areas, you can get this right online. So in our area, we're super digital. This is available right on the internet. We were doing some stuff in Kentucky, and that stuff in Kentucky, no, no, you walk through the door, you pay Nancy to go make the copy in the back room, and she charges you 25 cents a page and you know walks out and hands you the copy. It just depends on the municipality. It's smart because you potentially could actually save yourself money by getting the guy that did the property next door because he might already know that property or maybe he knows the owner, maybe he knows the situation. In fact, I mean, even before we get to this point, having that understanding, you might be able to ask that guy, hey, I saw that you did the yes. the sewer or the uh, septic on this property. I was thinking about buying this. I would love to work with you. What's your thoughts over there? Is that, oh my gosh, don't touch no, it. No, There's like a, a there's like a, uh, I don't know, like plutonium <laughs> rock underneath that <laughs> land and it's just impossible to dig a hole in it. I don't know if plutonium is worth anything, but yeah, that's, that's really good advice that I didn't even think about, even yeah. though I kind of understand it, but that's why from your experience, you've actually done this. Yes. And I know working with you, those people know way more than yes. you could ever on every single property. So our audience subscribes to get these insights and they're connected to us to hear these insights that we've learned over 20 years and thousands of real estate transactions. What I just told you is an old school developer hack. The old school developer hack is if I go to the neighbor and I know that person's a good surveyor, and I know there's a good engineer and a good designer that did that, they have solved 70% of the problems. And then if the wetland is sitting on the bottom corner over here, and it's going up at a 45 degree angle, and I'm buying the parcel right next to it, you can literally grab the pen and just slide it up and assume it just continued. You know what the setback is. You know what, what the, the setback. The amount of distance between yes. the 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 what do you call it the wetland fern that's protected by you know the government and where you can put Bingo. the edge of your house yeah practical stuff that's actually free information it's public record yeah so it's free but you have to go do the research and i'm not kidding this was taught to me by someone who had been developing for 30 years that i was just blessed to meet in my 20s when i first started in land development all right, section number two, planning and design. Number nine, create a site plan. So we assume every step before this, all eight of them have essentially worked out. Now we're moving forward. So we go to the civil engineer and we ask them to put together a detailed site plan. They take the survey and the topography. They take the sketch from the, from the wetland bio, uh, biologist. And if we know we're moving forward, they take the actual survey data from the wetland biologist because what they do is when they flag the, uh, the edge and create the buffer, they actually put in GPS coordinates on it. We have the drain field designer send over his stuff and the well site to the civil engineer. 
All this gets put on there, and then they have now probable home sites. And based on what the property looks like, we can now pick out of those potential home sites. See, everyone does this 1,000% backwards, and they just screw it up. They go pick out their house plans. They walk out on the property, and they go, the house goes here. That will cost you too much money. That's a mistake. You have to solve everything else and then go, what's left? Where's my best buildable area? Now I pick out the house plans to match the property. Then they lay out the driveway and figure out where the rest of the utilities are going to come in. Number 10, consider environmental impact. So we kind of already started talking about this, but the environmental impacts is the wetland biologists started to figure out where the wetland is and where the setbacks are. However, you also have to figure out stormwater. Stormwater in places like the Evergreen State and in certain parts of Texas and in Florida have, make a really big deal because the amount of rain that falls out of the sky or the rate at which the rain falls out of the sky. So like in, in the Phoenix area, stormwater is also a big deal even though it's a desert because it's torrential downpour. You got to figure out how deep the well is, okay? You can, generally speaking, you can go to the Department of Ecology and you can pull the well logs in the area and you can figure out how deep all of the neighboring wells are so I can start budgeting for them. You also have to start figuring out how much clearing is acceptable with that city or county and how much grading is acceptable with that city or county. So in our area, if you're gonna move, you know, it's a small number. It's like 5,000 yards of dirt, which isn't that much dirt. You have to get a grading permit. And so things like that add up really quick. You have to figure out how it specifically applies in the municipality that you're working with. Number 11, design for sustainability and future proofing. When we say this, sustainability and future proof, people go, what are you talking about? Sustainability. I'm talking about green. Okay. I am not a tree hugger, but I have kids, and we live in a beautiful area here in the Pacific Northwest, and I believe we do have to save some of the trees. I believe we have to save the environment. So whatever we can do to make less impacts and have a better long-term product that's more energy efficient, that's more sustainable, that possibly has wind or solar or a rain collector or the well doesn't pump all the time, it pumps up and it sits and holds in a giant holding tank. Also that we future-proof, that even if we're, maybe we're not buying solar today, we put the extra breaker in the box, we set the conduit up in the house for it, in the garage for the charging station for the Tesla, we, pop, we plumb just even a conduit pipe to the roof for when I want to put solar on later. There's a few things that you need to think about that for long-term future viability that you should totally be considering, even if you're not going to put the cost in today. It's cheaper to do it during the design process as well, because for the electrician to put in that extra breaker or whatever uh, while he's designing and doing everything else is kind of pennies compared to if you have to do it later, bust open the wall. He has to wire everything. Yes. Um, so I learned this when I was designing my house for literally just outlets. Outlets in places you know you're going to have an appliance even later. Or like, for example, sauna. Say yep. you can't afford a sauna right now, but you're like, you know, down the road, I want a sauna right here. So it'd be nice to have an outlet right here, even though I know I'm not going to use it right away. Because to, I don't, number one, to install an outlet after the fact probably is going to be 10x the cost potentially. Yep. But secondly, what if he can't get into the wall? Maybe it's ugly because it's like jerry-rigged. So those are things that I think is really important to think about about in terms of future proofing, it actually saves you a lot of money. And I know after living in my house now for 10 plus years, I've been so grateful that I installed those things, even though they yeah. cost a little um, extra because with inflation, probably would be way more now. Way more. And so that's one of the things people have to think about. Like if you want a sauna, most saunas aren't the little plug. They're the big plug, like a washer or a, or a or dryer. Um, most of them are like 120, so you're still going to need like a 20 amp. And then 
if you go to charge, you know, your electric vehicle, they'd love to see a 50 uh, uh, amp breaker, you know, for that. So one of the things to be thinking about is back in the day, that electrical panel used to be like 120 amps. Most of them today are 200. I'm telling you the home of the future needs 300. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's the, what do you think the price Maybe difference is? Maybe even four. What do you think the price difference between like a 200 amp and a 400 amp breaker box would be? Well, it's, it's not just the box. It's bringing the power in from the local utility. You've got to bring that much power in. That's bigger cable. So what do you think just off the top of your head? Off like, the top of your head, it's probably... The difference. Well, actually, hold on. With that shop we just did. Yeah. That shop that we did out there in Lake Stevens, I can tell you, because that was that was 400 amps. Okay, yeah. That 400 amps was uh, eight grand for the two boxes. Yeah. And it was almost eight grand from the PUD to drop the wire. How much if it was only 200? It probably would have been, you know... Uh, a little more than half of that, probably 60% of that. Okay, yeah. So it's still significant, yeah. but if you were to have to do all of that over... No, it would cost you double the next time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then- so you can never bring in enough power. Like, if you think, oh, I want a compressor, I want a shop. Oh, I want a pool. Budget that in now and build that in. You'd rather have too much power coming into the house than too little. Yeah, one last thing. I know that we're going long on it, but I'm also personally curious. It's also considering a factor that no one thinks about, but our power grid is stressed out. Yes. It's old. Yes. You know, a lot of this stuff was built in the 50s, maybe, or even before that. And you're seeing it in a lot of, I mean, every single season, whether it's winter or summer, there's always news reports about uh, brownouts happening or basically power not being able to be given to people because of some kind of disaster. More and more that's going to happen. So solar used to be a tree hugger, hippie kind of thing. Now might be like necessary. And then in Washington specifically, I I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't do this while you're building air conditioning. You got to uh, yes. put it in because I've seen so when there's heat waves and the price that these um, heating and cooling guys charge because there's so much demand is ridiculous. So if you can, like you said, even just putting in the power for it, Bingo. even putting in the pad. Yes. So that's another thing too. Just like when you're uh, planning out your foundation for the guy to put in the pad where the thing will go. Yeah. Just to get it done because yeah. for them it's super easy, it's almost next to nothing and all those are extra costs that when you go to do it years later at high demand can sometimes I'd be like 5 or 6x. Yeah, 100%. So 100%. Think about what's happening in the world and how uh power costs are going up. That will affect you where not only will you be grateful that you did it for the convenience and saving some money, you might save like you can't even account for it. Bingo. I think take it to another level. Washington State, I believe, within the next three to five years, is going to start to mandate solar on top and with all new building permits. I believe that's coming because there are parts of California where they have already mandated it. And so we follow California like a little duck in a line. So it's coming. That's why I say future proofing just makes sense. I also want to do some things like that because it creates savings, but it creates protection for my family. It creates, you know, just in case the zombie apocalypse, you know, maybe I I make it so I've got, you know, if I didn't put it in today, we wired it and made it ready for batteries and solar. Even if we didn't buy the Tesla Powerwall today. Number 12, design for easy. Okay. You look at this and you go, okay, what are you talking about? We've seen so many things where the person who, how do I say this nicely? Where the person who doesn't do this all the time gets an idea in their head and the house is turned the wrong way, the driveway is going up the wrong slope, the foundation's got to be eight feet deeper because of the way they want it to sit. 
you have to work with your consultants and the professionals and you have to slow down and you got to drop your ego and you go, Benji, in your professional opinion, how would you put this here? What do you see? And you got to let go because what they do is they know little tips and tricks and they can design it for easy, which is easier to build, which saves you time and money. But some of them just straight save you money. A good example is always understand when you build a box as a home, that is the cheapest thing ever. So a split level home is the absolute most cost efficient home to build. Why? The staircase you enter right in the middle, it's all stacked on top of each other. All the plumbing runs up in one or two central stacks and it just, you know, wise out from there. So it's all compact. Now a rambler or a ranch is the most spread out. It's got the biggest roof. It's got the longest plumbing runs. It's got the longest electrical runs, the most roof trusses. Therefore, it's the most expensive. Knowing these things, knowing that every little foundation corner is going to cost you $25 to $50 just in, just in the corner. That doesn't include the mud. That doesn't include anything else. They just automatically charge you for every corner. So the more efficient and easy that we can build, the more efficient and easy that we can develop, the more efficient and easy that we can lay out the whole construction process for our people, the more money we can save, which is money made in this process. Number 13, design for approvals. This is where working with the right people and having the right vision is essential. When you work in an area like we do with hard to deal with municipalities, aka cities, counties, they don't want to approve your stuff. They want to deny it. And so you need to try to engineer a plan that's easy to approve, a process that's easy to approve, that fits inside of their code, fits inside of their guideline, that is understandable and digestible. Quite often with all of our consultants, we actually write a written narrative so that when they look at the building permit or the land development application, they can read through what we're trying to do and then we reference what's happening. We lay it out for them like a cooking, you know, like a cooking recipe, like these are the steps. And so that's why pulling some of those old applications or getting the file that was already done on that property or the surrounding neighbors that got approved, you can kind of start to design for approvals when you see what's getting approved in the area. Number 14, confirm all utilities. So you have to confirm all the utilities. You have to confirm power. You have to confirm high-speed internet. We love our high-speed internet. You know, we live in a tech hub. There are multiple areas that you think it's not far from town. It's right there, and there is not high-speed internet right there. That's a problem, okay? Especially if you're going to work from home or your kids want a video game or you, you're like my family with 62 devices connected to the Wi-Fi at all times trying to stream. You need to confirm whether it's going to be on a well or there's public water available. You need to confirm where the local, uh, the local power is, how much it's going to cost to drop the power, whether it's going overhead or underground, how far that run's going to be, and if the power is available or if you're going to have to upgrade the local service to even get it to you. Shouldn't you be doing this way before you're <clears throat> at this stage, searching and buying the land phase? So this is in the applying for the permit you have to start confirming that, yes, up front, but I also want you to reconfirm it again. So we did mention the utilities in the first part of this video, but in this, per so we assume that you already looked, number one, that was part of the assumption. Okay, now for the permit, we're reconfirming with everyone. We're calling them again, but I'm trying to just make it really blunt, like don't mess this up. And the reason I ask is we have another video where you talk about searching and buying land specifically and you talk a lot about that yes i mean i know i do that because i need the internet so i look at the land's location as much as i look at the land's access to cable okay section three permitting process number 15 pre-application so a lot of municipalities uh allow what's called a pre-application 
and we call it a pre-app. This is the secret sauce that makes tons of money because a pre-app, generally speaking, what they're going to do is they're going to take your fee for their pre-application meeting. They go pre-flight your idea to the fire department, power, permitting, planning, all that, and they give you a giant list of comments and they give you the step-by-step -step process also, they then generally take that fee and apply it towards your building permit. So this is one of those easy buttons that then speeds up the process. If the municipality allows a pre-app meeting, I would highly suggest doing it. Number 16, permits. So now we're going to get our building permit. One of the things I want you to triple double check is, is it just a building permit? Most municipalities actually have more than one permit you apply for. So I'm going to give you a list of potential permits. You may have a building permit. You may have a plans permit. There may be an architectural design permit. Thank you, City of Mount Vernon. Clearing permit, grading permit, stormwater permit, power permit, drain field application, well site application. And there may be others. But double, triple check, because a lot of times... The permit tech on the other side or the person behind the counter doesn't know exactly what you're asking for, so they give you one, when in reality, you may have three you have to apply for in order to be able to go build the home. Section four, permitting follow-up and tips. Number 17, running log book. You have to keep a running logbook of the activities, the requests, the timelines, the communications, who you spoke with, what they said they were going to do, and when they said they were going to do it by. So we run this very simply, and I recommend you do the same. Open up Google Docs because it's accessible on your phone. Uh, we run multiple as different tabs. You would just have one tab. You put the tax ID, the address, the project file number, the permit number, any list of permits in there. You keep a running log, date, who I spoke with, what they said they were going to do, when they said they were going to do that. Why would we track all this, Benji? Why would we make sure? Because one, we want to stay on track with our own selves, make sure we don't miss anything. And also, it's just a great resource to have when somebody else says oh you should have done this like oh let me look at my logbook oh july 24th we had this conversation i i must have i must have accidentally put this in there and they're like oh actually i think i remember that i don't know is that why that's you're nailing it it's so important for you to be able to reference when you spoke about it previously to reference oh that was during review number one Review number two, this was the action that was recommended at that time. This was our response to that reaction. You can see that in this attachment or you can see it uploaded on this date. That way you can walk them through it because they're humans. They're busy and things get moved around. Your job is to check in and, and keep them moving through the steps in the process. Number 18, all the money is made in the follow-ups. All the money is made in the FU in real estate. And the FU is the follow-ups. You want to follow up two to three times a week. You want to say, hey, what's the next step? When do you think this can be done by? How will I know it's done? When can I expect that communication? What does that look like? I like to pretend I'm, su I'm super stupid. And I go, yeah, you know, so, so what's the next step? Okay. And then... Who's going to do that? Great. What's their timeline to get that done in? Cool. And then do you guys send me an email? Does that come out in the file? Do I just check back in with you? Sounds good. Just write in the logbook and then follow up. And did I say two to three times a week you do that? Yeah. No one's going to care about your deal as much as you're going to care about their deal. So don't assume Bingo. they're keeping track or that even they're going to remember. I mean, if they're having a bad day there at County and we, are they still remote for us? Partially. <laughs> so they're, they're at on. home and they're watching Netflix yeah. and they're getting to the email yeah. and thinking they're working. You just got to be the person being on top of everything related to this. And trust me. I know because I did it for a single house in a very simple lot, yeah. and I had to do this follow-up all the time. It's probably worse now. Okay, number 19, first review. 
So when they come out with their first review, so generally speaking, unless you're in an easy to work with municipality, you'll probably go through multiple reviews. They come out with their multiple reviews and I want you to hold your emotions in your heart for a second because it literally says all over the place, denied, deficient, doesn't work, explain. And so when you first see it, it's really, you know, you're, you're kind of crestfallen. You feel crushed. You're like, I'm never going to be able to build my dream home. So I want you to know that going in. Number two, you're going to read through all of the notes, all the comments, and you're going to pick out because what happens is you get a lot of the same comments over and over again from different departments or about the same item. Then your job is to create a list of the one items or the five to 10 items, whatever it is, and then prioritize that list. And then next to that list, you write down which consultant solves that problem. Then you reach out to the consultant and you send them the comments and you say, hey, item 12, I believe is yours, but please read through the whole thing. This is what I believe the problem is. How long to get that this corrected? Also, if it's a, a bigger issue, what you're then going to do is you're going to get them all onto a Zoom and you're going to have a meeting to walk through it together. At the end of the meeting, you make sure every single item on your outline has someone's name attached to it, even if it's yours, and a deadline attached to it. That is the most important. Number 20, the second review. Oh, so now we're in for the second review. We got the same set of problems over again. This is where your logbook comes in handy. They say, oh, I don't understand this elevation. It doesn't look correctly. Oh, we addressed that elevation. Here's where you can see it on page 17. So you need to be able to explain to them. You need to be able to reconfirm everything with them. You do the same outline again. You have the same meeting with your people again, and you review it. One thing you want to do with both of these is you want to double check everything before it goes back in. So you get all the documentation from the consultants, okay, or the person doing the land development or the permit coordination, you know, or your consultant does this, and then sit down and go through the list with them and confirm each item is addressed before it's resubmitted because you don't want to have to keep going through review after review after review because every time you submit something, generally speaking, there could be a one to a nine-week lag before they even look at it. So always double-check your package to make sure you're addressing all the issues. Number 21, call them on their BS. This is where you have to have care and candor and be pleasing yet firm. Going back to our logbook, we say, hey, this review is supposed to be done by this time. This timeline was missed. Some things they try to do too in multiple reviews is they'll try to sneak in new items. They'll just add something new that they didn't know about. That's not your responsibility. Like Most of them are going to have to be addressed, but you need to tell them, hey, we can't keep adding other things in. We have to address this all at once. We want to get this done. You have to address mistakes as they happen, both on the consultant side and on the city or the county side. You've got to be willing to get face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, belly-button-to-belly-button. You've got to be willing to call their boss. You have to be willing to call the head of the department, the mayor, the city council, the county council member, in order to get your project done. If you let this sit, this will cost you time, money, and emotional stress and heartache. When your dream home is not being built, your significant other is in pain because you told them, this is my dream, I'm going to get it done for you, and she just stares at you and goes, why is this not done, babe? Okay, and it causes you stress, and you feel like you're failing your kids and your family. And I'm and I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I've done so many of these. I can see what happens and how they're communicating. They feel like they're letting them down. So you have to draw the line. Number twenty-two. Ask them how they would do it. This is a secret sauce. Like you go to them and you go, "Hey, Benji, you you said fix you know item twelve here. How would you correct that?" Oh, cool. Is there any other ways that you would correct that? Is there any creative things that people have done? What would you absolutely not approve? Is there anything you hate? 
Uh, we were doing a project and the planner said, you know, I really hate pervious uh, concrete. Don't install it. I hate it. And the pervious concrete is just, you know, blacktop or concrete where water uh, can uh, go through it. But it tends to crack and stuff like that. And that was her, her pet peeve. We ripped it right out of the project, put something else in there. Number 23, provide examples of how to solve the problem. Okay. They come up with an issue and you may need to call them or have the meeting and talk through the issue in order to solve it. Come with three ways to solve the problem and a visual way to solve the problem. So uh, we had a drainage issue uh, on one property and also because of slope and there was a property sitting underneath it. So we came with multiple ways to deal with the water running off of the building and coming down the hill. Three different solutions. And we told them we like solution one the best, but we believe all of these are viable. What are your thoughts? Walk through the pros and cons of each one. Why did I choose number one? I chose number one because it was the easiest to do and the most cost efficient. So I'm trying to sell number one, but always have examples and always give them a way or a path forward. The city or the county is never going to solve the problem for you. That's you and your consultant's job. Number 24, research how others have solved the problem. So this goes back to that idea of what permits have been approved in that area. So if there's a wetland issue, look how they solved it. If there's a drainage issue, look how they solved it. If there's a drain field issue, how they solve it. Foundation issue, whatever it may be. Go figure out how other people have solved it because if it's already been approved that way, they're going to approve it that way again. Number 25, double check everything before the next submittal from the last review. Okay, and we said this, but it's worth mentioning again. You double, triple check. You go back through the outline, you review it with your consultants, and you say, okay, this solves this problem, this solves this problem. Because the timelines on every review just get going and going and going on forever. We have done projects that have gone into the fifth review. And you just, you, you're like, it's maddening and you're just burning money. So anything you can do to prevent those. Number 26, got your permit. Congratulations. You were tenacious. You pushed through the process and you were able to obtain your building permit. So the next part of this process and the next thing that we're going to record about is basically like, going and getting bids and doing your construction budget. And then we're going to talk about the build process last. So for those of you that uh, have not already, please like this. Leave us a comment if you have any question and subscribe for more content about land, building, land development. Let's go.